Hello, and welcome to NPR's podcast on Silicon Valley. I'm Arthi Shahani, technology correspondent who is based here. I cover the biggest companies on Earth, the companies that are changing how you make money, how you fall in love, maybe who you vote for. And I am in the studio with my buddy, Sunil, who I met on Twitter. My name is Sunil Rajaraman, and I'm a writer and entrepreneur that's been focused here on building early stage companies in the Valley for the last 10 years. It's great to be here with you, Arthi. And yeah, of course, it's this is like a classic Silicon Valley story. I write a piece on Medium and and we find each other on Twitter. A satire that didn't read like satire. Very <laughs> clever, made me laugh. But I was like, oh, he's a documentarian. Sunil and I decided to try doing this podcast together because we thought we were a really good insider-outsider pair. Someone like Arthi, what uh, immediately you know resonated uh, with, with me and Arthi is she has a very good critical eye toward things that we're building here in the Valley. And That's I'm very much the, the outsider role. <laughs> the outsider role. And while I do write satire... I would consider myself a bit of an insider and cheerleader for this place. As you, a, raise, you show leg to VCs. You're an insider. Exactly. Venture and capitalist. Sorry. That's what that means. Building another founding, you know, part of another founding team again. So uh, I love I love starting companies and I love the ecosystem and I love the people here. We wanted to do this show not like a, some sales vehicle for products, right? Like if you tune in and you listen to someone trying to sell you something, you can tweet at us. You can write at us. You can threaten us. That is not the point of the show. It's not for people to like pump up what they're doing. But what we wanted was a show where we're really holding a mirror to the culture of this place, the the inner workings of this land of millionaires and billionaires that's rewiring the world. And the culture really is fascinating. And it's difficult to cover the culture uh, here. It's pretty opaque. So few people want to talk. I know your heart, your job must be pretty hard. Well, you make it easier. <laughs> he <laughs> passes me a lot of cell phone numbers when he's not supposed to. <laughs> I'm trying to, but you know, uh, it's a uh, when you put a microphone in front of somebody or you start taking notes, they change. They do. And we'll get into that in later episodes. In this first episode, we were talking about people we might interview. And you strongly pitched this guy, DJ Patel. How come? DJ literally invented the term data science. And so that's become a very uh, pop culture centric term uh, where a lot of people are claiming to be data scientists. Just do a search on LinkedIn mm-hmm. and you'll see maybe some of your friends have even claimed to be data scientists. But DJ's the real deal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the man he, who coined the term, the man who invented the term. And President Obama literally created the uh, the position chief data scientist for DJ. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Uh, so his, uh, you it's know, like surgeon general for data and using data in a in you know, a meaningful way to impact our lives positively. Yeah. And there's there's another reason, Sunil, right? Like he's like a thing here. He's a thing. And. I've known about him for a long time. He uh, he actually went to high school with my sister in Monta Vista High School, which is, you know, in Cupertino, one of the one of the more famous high schools here in the Silicon Valley. He's produced a lot of uh, alums who have ended up here in the in the tech industry. But, um, you know, people look up to him in the entrepreneur community, but you know, specifically the Indian American entrepreneur community. All right, and so we got on the phone with DJ, and it was a great conversation. But you know. As soon as he started talking about his dad, I started feeling like, wait, maybe dad's a bit more interesting or as interesting. <laughs> well, dad created the, uh, the the largest networking organization in the Silicon Valley called TAI, which is for the Indus Entrepreneurs. And it was kind of considered a rite of passage as a young Indian person here growing up in the Silicon Valley to volunteer for TAI, which I did when I was 12 years old. It was like your version of the Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, they uh, they, they embed that career mindedness in, in you here from a young age. But uh, volunteering for Thai was, you know, kind of mandatory. And like, what would you do? You would like make business plans or something? Well, they put on this uh, large conference called, you know, TyCon, uh, mm-hmm. which uh, which we discuss with Suhas a bit and, and he talks about. But um, I, I volunteered to help. Uh, I think it was either print flyers or put them in packets for TyCon. What I vividly remember of the valley was there were orchards everywhere. And at one time I went to visit uh, IBM. It looked like, uh, you know, field after field after field. And I thought maybe I was lost. I remember as a five-year-old what what the Silicon Valley looked like and how different it looks now. Mm -hmm. And Not to date you, but that's back in the 1980s. 
Well, you know, uh, let's just say I, uh, I age in dog years. No, that actually doesn't work to my advantage. It was really interesting hearing Suhas describe what life was like and what the valley looked like during that time. It, it wasn't just a wasteland of office parks. No, it wasn't. The immigrant story and immigrant experience depends on what, what background and what abilities you come to this country with. You know, the common experience of uh, immigrants when they come in, kind of come and start participating, uh, is that the public in general do not quite understand your capability and what you can actually do and contribute. Okay, That uh, you go through a phase where you establish your credentials in the community and the onus to prove that indeed you can be a very contributing member you know, is upon you. We were considered great techies because we had gone to, you know, technology universities, you know, MIT, Berkeley, Stanford, and other institutions, and had never proven ourselves as business people. So you were the help. But let me ask you a question. Is if... Sorry to jump in. Go ahead. <laughs> but but if you, let's suppose if you came in and you went to a venture firm and you said, hey, I've got this great idea. I think I can do it. Uh, and I want to be CEO. What would, what would the response have been? Well, I had not only that problem, but I had one more problem, which was, in fact, even a bigger problem. I was going to build a semiconductor company without building a, a semiconductor fabrication facility. I was proposing that the way to build semiconductor companies of tomorrow was use somebody else's production ability. And besides that... And, and that means just simply put, kind of outsource that. Like you would design it but have somebody else build it. Just like if, you know, a photographer takes a good picture and say, those days you would send it to Kodak to have it processed. Okay. And for, uh, for context of our listeners, this was a time when Silicon Valley was called Silicon Valley because of silicon chips. And this must have been a controversial idea because you had companies like Applied Materials building manufacturing equipment for semiconductors, Intel, et cetera. This must have been a rather a controversial idea. Though I have to say, as I listen to this, I mean, a lot of people get investment capital, even if they've never started a company before. So did it matter that you were Indian? What you're doing is you're laying out one big challenge for your very business idea. So I, in my case, because I came from MIT and had superb education, plus research behind me. I think, yes, they may have had doubts about uh, my ability to run a company, you know, as an Indian, but much greater doubts were uh, about what I was proposing the industry should be. Okay? And on top of it, I was going to do that using tools that I had developed, software tools, for uh, uh, designing uh, chips, which the industry did not have. And they didn't believe that any uh, chip worthy of high volume production could be done with it. So we had many, many issues to overcome. And my experience a meeting with venture capitalists that time is they'll say, oh, so as what you're doing is revolutionary. Well, the word revolutionary uh, is bad to the extent revolution involves a lot of risk. <laughs> okay. 
So you had to finally talk with enough people and the venture capitalists who came to my aid uh, was uh, Fred Nazem from New York who used to come here who had scientific background. He had been to Caltech and he looked at it and you know, felt very comfortable with my thesis and says, maybe Suhas is right. And then he said, okay, Suhas, I will help you. And I have a completely different take. Did it, did it matter? <laughs> I guess a couple of questions. Did it matter that you were Indian growing up? Yeah. And what, what's your different take? Yeah, so there, there's a, uh, what's fascinating hearing this, because we've, I, I mean, one of the things is, I haven't heard this concrete narrative and because we hear bits and pieces of stories. But the part there that's interesting for me is that as a kid sitting in the background and what I observed in this uh, in this scenario is much more of you had an idea. You're swimming upstream of all these other ideas to to actually make this happen. And as you're doing that, people are saying, well, maybe you actually need more of this. And one of the powerful things about watching uh, my dad go through this is actually it motivating me to say, hell no, like we got to have a different approach. And like we have to we have to have a different level of us being able to be in control of our destiny, that we had to have the ability to actually build companies and do things in in and be able to do it on in our own way without the dependence on other people saying, well, you need this or you need this or this because they may not believe in your direct ability. So when when I moved here and I, you know, as I was in I was born in India, but, you know, largely have grown up here. But I, I you know, I am an immigrant and growing up here when I like, when we first moved here, you know, Cupertino, like my dad was saying, it, it was mostly fields. It's mostly orchards. It, there wasn't it was that and military personnel. And so I grew up learning how to shoot and, you know, like all the things that you could kind of think about a more rural area. And for me, with all the friends that I knew, what my dad was doing was the outlier. All the other parents in Boy Scouts, dad's in construction, dad's in, in uh, you know, the military or a veteran. Uh, my dad was the only entrepreneur. And when we had career day, and my dad's like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> how, come I, how come I'm the odd kid out? Like, why can't my dad be the normal person? Mm -hmm. But I was fortunate enough to grow up in the background where that was very much the ethos mm -hmm. of try, that didn't work, try, that didn't work. And, and the reflection I have is what I saw you doing was much more of – try this isn't working necessarily in just society or these functional systems from venture to all these other pieces i mean remember this is silicon valley when there was one indian store i think right bahat bazaar right and then we'd go there and get some samosas or something like there was no there was maybe another indian restaurant i don't think there was anything else did you feel isolated i felt uh, well i yes and no so I felt isolated in the sense of some of my ideas and how to carry and uh, how to how to really I felt isolated from an intellectual perspective of being able to stimulate my mind and try new ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very fortunate that that my father really pushed me to explore those. You started mm -hmm. uh, with a few friends, the Indus Entrepreneurs, which is. A very important group in Silicon Valley as well as worldwide. I was uh, looking at some of the background on it. According to Time, uh, it may be Thai, which is the acronym. According to Time, uh, Thai may be the most successful networking organization in the world. It's a, quite a powerful statement. Why did you start Thai? What's the backstory of that? So Thai started when... Um you know, several of us had succeeded, uh, you know, in building our business in Silicon Valley. And uh, we re had been very aware that 
you know, we did not have, you know, the sort of easy time getting mentors and help of others, even though we did. In fact, we succeeded because in spite of that, those who could establish relationship with successful people and mentors succeeded, but that was not easy to do. And in our middle age, we were sort of wondering, now that we had succeeded in building companies, how to give back to the community and society. And being entrepreneurs, we wanted to do it in a way that would be uh, far more impactful than you know just writing checks, which we were and a already. return on investment. <laughs> well, impactful, right? Okay. Which is um, so. We actually deliberated for almost uh, one year and came to the conclusion where we could make the biggest impact was to help next generation of entrepreneurs succeed. Uh, more often and with a larger success. And when we went about doing that, we were very thoughtful and wanted to create an organization which we would consider our gift to the community, which was open to everyone, not just people of our ethnic background. And, you know, I was chosen as the leader by the group that came together, okay? And they all promised to work with me. And one of the biggest exercises of skill that I had to do was all of these friends of mine, they had built companies, and they were running companies. But this was a non-profit, you know, it's a not-for-profit organization for the benefit of the next generation of entrepreneurs, right? So I had to have the skill of everybody coming together. And, and and I had to use techniques like I said, oh, we got to have some shared experience that we all feel very proud about. Mm -hmm. And for that, I designed what is now known as TICON. Uh, okay? The conference. The, the conference. conference. Mm -hmm. And the conference... Uh, was Which done Neil and I, we've with, both been. Yeah. Yeah. Was very successful and established as our launch pad and gained the credibility with the venture, venture capitalists. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the, you can see that, you know, once you are you know, a, a entrepreneur and innovator, it starts influencing everything you do. Well, I, I think DJ. Uh, so my take is is very much more of I think that we've opened certain doors, but we've also if we look at the the statistics of where we are right now with the number of female venture partners who are of different uh, different ethnicities, as well as we look at founders of different ethnicities and gender, we're not seeing the numbers that we should relative to the entire population. And what I, th I firmly believe is needed and continues to be needed is more of this community, uh, community building, community organizing approach. And I think we actually need to be asking everybody who's saying, hey, look, I'm a mentor. We should be asking, OK, well, if you are a great mentor, what's, what's that ratio look like of people that you actually are mentoring? And how can you carry more people forward with you? So just to sort of say it back to you guys, it sounds like – in your experience, I mean, as a family coming to Silicon Valley and trying to make it your home, you'd say that a formula for culture change that you think worked for you guys was, first of all, you prove yourself. I mean, what the value, what the Valley values a lot is success in business, and you had it. And when you had it, it became a platform to convene, and the structure of that convening was an organization that grew bigger and bigger with the mixing of successful entrepreneurs and aspiring that's basically. I would yeah. with one addition. Yeah. Is mm -hmm. Silicon Valley is very much a culture of you have to continually prove yourself. Th this is the thing of, of like even if you go away and you come back, 
It doesn't matter who your connections are. Connections can help a bit, but you still have to prove your value. So, you know, your bottom line take, I mean, part of why Sunil and I were interested in talking with you guys is that you had some success at cultural transformation here. Because as we see it, Indian men, at least, are doing very well. I mean, when you think about even the CEOs of some of the largest companies, Satya Nadella at Microsoft, Sundar Pichai at Google, I mean, there has been a massive transformation at the very top. If you want to raise the standard of living of a community to twice what it is today, okay, the only way to accomplish that is to create wealth that is equal to the wealth you have today. Okay? And you know, if it is done by many people, that wealth and jobs will be spread. So that is my formula, you know, for making America great. So uh, let's let's get right into because this brings up some interesting, of course, political issues. Silicon Valley is in the spotlight for a lot of a lot of, you know, hot hot issues right now. I'll just leave it you know, but DJ, what's I mean, what is your view of Trump's proposed merit based immigration system? I mean, where do you start with this, those statements? Uh, because, you know, here's the fundamental challenge that that President Trump is talking about is that there's no single measure to assess value. You know, value isn't just measured by economic potential. We have phenomenal artists and pick your favorite dimension of creators, people who make things. And these these are hardworking people who take care of people in their community and make our country richer in all dimensions. And if we look at our track record of, of immigrants, whether it's Nobel Prize winners to pick your favorite dimension, we're better when we have immigration. Uh, if we look at just some of the statistics of of what happens under population as our population ages, and what are we going to need to backfill to keep productivity high, to continue the engine of America? There's no way to find a solution for that without immigration. And immigration can't be a lottery ticket of binary, you know, person number one gets it, person number two doesn't if they're a family. Mm -hmm. You know, what this country has done is empowered generation after generation of those people. And how about you, Dad, Suhas? Do you agree with that or do you have a different take on it? I believe in lined up, as in football lineup, okay? And you succeed by having the strongest lineup that you can manage to put together. So all these uh, immigrants who come with, you know, not only, you know, great learning that the, their countries have invested in, but also by very nature, leaving their land and coming here, they're all risk takers, okay? So I consider them very valuable. So Sunil, I have to say, I, I loved the conversation with them. Uh, and, you know, I'm sorry, by the way, that I ended up cutting us off at the end. I know that you wanted to talk more with DJ about things he was opening up about, but about the policy questions, the big questions about regulating the tech companies. And, you know, I feel like basically we were, we were running out of studio time. And uh... Yeah, but somehow you managed to sneak in a few of your own questions there at the end. <laughs> they were important. Import, but... Important. Let's uh, Let's let the listeners determine how important they are. But I will say this. They're definitely amusing. Yeah, this is what we call the lightning round, which uh, we'll be bringing to future guests. We're ready? Facebook or Twitter? I'd say Facebook. Twitter. More sleep or less sleep? Less sleep is okay. Less sleep. Time's too short. Raw water or filtered water? Filtered water. <laughs> filtered water. <laughs> Tesla or Ford 150? What is Ford 150? <laughs> the the Ford, truck. Ford 150? The Ford one, the truck. Ford truck. Oh, Tesla, of course. Uh, can we have a Tesla Ford 150? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, sex parties or bungra parties? I, I think it's bungra parties. Bungra parties. <laughs> uh, NPR or iHeartRadio? Oh, NPR. NPR, of course. There we go. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> no, we tried it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Arthi Shahani. I'm Sunil Rajaraman. Thanks for listening.